Okay, welcome this morning. I am very interested in helping people who have been suffering emotional issues because there's so many people out there in the world and also in the church who are suffering from depression, from anxiety and from just feelings that they just don't know how to handle, just don't know how to cope. So I'm going to talk to you this morning about this and I want to talk to you about how, and you might identify with it yourself or you might identify it with it as for somebody that you, you want to help. But there are two types of emotional damage that people have received. One is what others have done to them. For instance, if they've lived in a home with an abusive often father figure, but it could even be a mother or other sibling, and that they have felt somebody criticise them or someone is angry with them. Often it can be an absent father, especially in that critical age of boys when they're aged 12 to 14. And sometimes the father doesn't have to be physically absent, but it just can be emotionally absent from them. And if a boy aged 12 to 14 has the absence of a father in his life, they will suffer emotional pain that they really find it very difficult to get over. Okay, so that's one source, what other people have done to them. But there's another type of pain that people suffer from is when people or when people should receive nurturing and love and they don't for instance a children should feel loved they feel should feel nurtured they should feel protected they should feel like they've been affirmed they should feel secure they should feel wanted. And often parents, because of their own dysfunction, are unable to give this to their children. And so the cycle continues. And what happens then? It affects them how they view themselves. It affects how they respond to others. It affects how they react to others when someone presses and their emotional trigger. It affects how they view God. Do they feel, look at God as a tyrant? Do they look at God as their literal earthly father who was maybe absent? I want you to remember that Jesus is able to heal any pain. I want you to remember that. Remember Psalm 147 verse 3 says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up the wounds. And we've talked in the meetings we've already had this morning of the urgency we have in the time that we have ahead of us. And I believe that there's going to be a very, in the very short future, there's going to be a mighty work when people, medical missionary workers, do go out and they are able to be used by God to actually heal the broken in heart. They will be used by him. And remember it, I want to state this right at the very outset, the only way to transform someone's heart is through Jesus. The only way. Yes, Christian counsellors can help if they use the blueprint of the word of God and prayer. They can help. But the only way is through the power of God. Did you know that in 1930s, when Alcoholics Anonymous was started up, they had an 80% success rate, but now they have a 2% success rate because the, it is not politically correct to use God in their program anymore. So I want to share with you, first of all, some different ways people respond to protect themselves from pain. And you might identify with these. But remember, they're all fixable. If you are teachable, you are fixable. They emotionally detach from their pain. Their pain, they just get good at stuffing it inside of them. They just pretend that it's not there. Sometimes others can see it, but they deny it. They are just, and they emotionally t detach from it. Others disassociate or lose their memory. 
They just sort of put it all behind them. It's, the pain is too hard. And it's interesting because 90% of the how you react, if you're in a situation and you're in marriage, 90% of the way you reacted as an adult in your marriage is tied to how you reacted as a child. And 90% of the time when spouse is stepping on your pain and how you react is how you reacted as a child. So people purp don't purposely disassociate, but they don't remember. Others self-focus on their pain. Their pain, they talk about their pain. No one appreciates me. No one ever talks to me. I just, no one wants me around. They just get self, very self-focused on their own pain. And, you know, if you're living with someone like this, whether it is a spouse or, or a sister or brother or whoever, or parent or whoever, it can be emotionally draining to live with these sort of people because they do emotionally drain you. Another way is they control or dominate you. Okay, so they try to be stronger than the one, the person who has damaged them, and they take charge. They are ready. They want to be always right. They, they have had little or no love in their home. It's very interesting because an angry father who dominates and dominates his son, the son will grow up, he in turn will dominate his wife and children. It's just a perpetual cycle. It's just an angry cycle, dominating cycle. Another thing is 90% of sexually abused girls become 90% dominant and 90% hostile and angry and 95% of them will get divorced. Why? Because we can't... We, it's too hard and they just want to control and dominate. Others hold on to bitterness. Okay, they hold on, they become very cynical, very negative. They uh, even pretend that everything's right with them, but they become quite hypocritical and they don't realise it. But they're holding on to that bitterness. And remember what the scriptures say about the root of bitterness? We have to cut that out. You can't just cut off the tops and the shoots of a plant. You have to dig out those roots, the roots of bitterness, because bitterness and all these emotions are powerful enough to make you very sick. They react with anger. Remember, anger is never the source of the pain. It's just the response that has come from something else. So they are often aggressive. They're often, often argumentative when a sore point is touched. And yet they wouldn't, be, wouldn't react with anger if they were talking to a stranger. They're quite civil to strangers out there, but you get into the home circle where their guard is down, they will react. Others get critical and judgmental. Now, this is something because, you know, usually you, you may have grown up in a home where your parents belittle and they put people down. And then when children grow up to become married, they do the same. And do you know that it's really interesting because when I think back in my childhood, in my age group, this is how I was brought up. All my peers, all my relatives, all my friends, you know, this is it. There's either black, there's white. You don't fit in here, you're, just, you're judged, right? That's it. You, 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 you just belong. You're, you know, you have not fit into my little mould, into my little square. So... This is what happens. So it's something that we have to understand and realise that it's very easy to fall into. Others stop talking. I'll give you the silent treatment. And sometimes you can get the silent treatment for hours, weeks, days, years. I once heard, a, heard some... Uh, on, on the television when they saying that a couple in Japan hadn't spoken for 22 years. Why? Because 22, finally the children got them together and to sort it out and they, because 22 years ago the husband got jealous because the wife talked to another man. Do you know, they can say several things. They can say, oh, you know, pass the salt or, you know, things like that. Yes, but nothing emotional. Nothing emotional. They shut down. 
Others work to cover their pain. It's just work, 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 work. And look, men, it's not wrong to want to work. It is proper that pe men work and provide for their families. That's what God's put into, into men. But they focus so much that they get the balance and they're unbalanced. Others pull their heart away. They keep people at a distance. They actually, in a way, you, they build these invisible walls around them. No one gets close to me because that's the way they won't be hurt anymore. But they might even allow animals in there. Yeah, they might allow a dog or a cat or a horse or someone. They might allow them in, but no people. They, they turn to alcohol, sex, lust, food, temporal possessions, or basically any addiction. How many people turn to the refrigerator when they have pain? To cover their pain. Very interesting with men and men who are addicted to pornography. Did you know that 70, they have found that 70 to 80 percent of men who are addicted to pornography are covering emotional pain from their childhood? If they were introduced to pornography at a young age and then they were exposed to pornography, and instantly he is sexually aroused, he loses his depression and he is hooked because of the addiction, because of the rejection he suffered. That happens with men, but what about women? Women, they get into a fantasy. And it's not necessarily a sexual fantasy. They just fantasise about being with someone else who will treat them nice, treat them kind, or he'll be more loving to me, or he'll be more spiritual. So we've all got problems, a whole lot of us. Some are addicted to drinking alcohol, doing drugs, by shopping. These people, they just have pain that's never been cared about. Others lie to protect themselves. Why do they lie? Because they know that if they tell the truth, they'll be rejected. So they cover it. They, want to, they, don't, want to, they don't want to fear rejection again. Others become defiant. They get very, very defiant. And you see them all out there in the society, out there on the news, all these young gang members, they said, no one tells me what to do. Why? Because they had been dominated earlier in their younger years, in their formative years. They break the law. They do all sorts of things. Nobody tells them what to do. Now, the other the last point that I'm going to bring up in this section is they become hypersensitive. Okay, they're so super, super sensitive. They trigger intense feelings about anything and everything. And they can have this feeling of guilt. Oh, I feel guilty. I feel worthless. I'm no good. Nothing. I'll never amount to anything. <coughs> now, believe me, guilt is there. God has given us guilt. We should feel guilty if we have sinned. That's right. But I'm talking about a guilt that's a false guilt. It's not a real guilt. It's a guilt of, oh, I just don't know what I... Why did I do this? They're so, they, they make a decision and they get so guilty that they've made the wrong decision. I'm totally useless. I'll never amount to any. My father is right what my father said about me. Okay, so these are ways that we protect ourselves what we do. But how do we think? Okay, so well, how we think, we can be get anxious, we can be get nervous, we can get worried. We have fear, we blame ourselves, we have paranoia. As I said, we get guilty. They get very discouraged, they get despondent, they have despair and depression. And you know what we need to do is understand the only way we can be healed from this is we have to allow God into our hearts to search our hearts out, to find out and to bring 
every thought into captivity. All these things, these negative words and these negative thoughts we're putting into our mind, we have to start bringing them into captivity to God. We've got to know whose voice we're listening to. Remember the voices that we hear? There's different sources of the voices. We've got the Holy Spirit and we've got God. We've got... But Satan also speaks to us through those brain waves that we hear the voice of that spiritual realm. Whose voice are we listening to? Are we listening to the voice of Satan or are we listening to the voice of God? We have to know whose voice we're listening to. And remember, Satan will whisper words into your ear of depression. He will discourage you. Jesus never does that, never ever does that because Jesus cares so much for our heart. He loves us so much and we have to realise this. There is hope for every single person who has this emotional damage, every single one of us. Remember, if you are teachable, you are fixable. Just stop and think for a, for a moment of, uh, of an ideal family, a God-given family. God has placed a male in the family and if he's doing his job as God wants him to do, he will care for his little child. You take a little child and if the little child, the man will hold the little child's hand and if the child falls over and stumbles, he'll pick it up. If it hurts itself, he'll hold it up, he'll, listen, he'll lift it up and he'll say, What's the matter? Daddy will be here. He'll, he'll, he'll heal you. He'll help you. So if God has placed this duty of care in an earthly father, don't you think that our heavenly father has a duty of care for us? And you know, I believe he takes it even more seriously than an earthly father would. He wants to talk to us. He wants to communicate with us, but he wants us to... It has to be two-way. He wants us to listen to him and he wants us to speak to him. And our view of God has to be one of the... We, we know, have to know that God loves us so much. In Psalm 139, if you go through it in the future, just remember Psalm 139, it goes through. He knows everything about us. He perceives our thoughts. He knows his hands hold us up. Every day is planned with a purpose. God's thought about us are more numerous than the sands he, than he created. We have to believe these texts. He loves us with such love. Isaiah 43 verses 1 and 2 says we are precious in his sight. He calls us friends and wants to communicate with us. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. How does God demonstrate he cares for us? Isaiah 41 verses 80, 10. Do you know he knows our name. Can you imagine the God of the universe knows exactly who we are? He knows everything about us. He identifies us as his. He desires to be with us. He desires to be our God. He desires to strengthen us. We have to reassure us, ourselves, how much God loves us, how much God wants to help us, how much he wants us healed. And he wants to hold our hand. You know, if God cared for the sparrow, how much more did he care for us? God cares for the lilies in the, in, the, in the field. How much more does he care for us? Remember, we have to know his voice. We have to be able to hear it. And if we don't hear it, we have to start asking God to help us to be able to discern his voice. Okay, so we've looked now at how emotions damage our actions and our thoughts and how much God loves us. But I want to talk to you about just a little bit different, but on the same theme. What happens to our body when we get toxins in, in our body? Okay, so when we know we've got sick, we know we've got toxins in our body that have made us sick. So we might go on a cleanse, and we might cleanse our 
whatever we cleanse our bowel, we cleanse our blood, we cleanse our liver, we cleanse our organs. Sometimes though toxins get placed in places that are much harder to clean. How do you get toxins out of your brain? Okay, did you know that we know that if you have actual literal toxins in your brain, you have to send a chelating agent in there and it has to grab hold of that toxin. A chelating agent is like a claw and it has to hold onto the toxin and pull it out. So we know that if we want to get healthy in a physical sense, we have to get rid of toxins. Now, what about if we want to cleanse ourselves of any unwanted feelings and emotion? You know, like those feelings and emotions I talked about a moment ba back? I want to tell you something about part of our brain. We have a section in our brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is a seat of our emotion and it, in it is a stored memory of every single emotion that you have been through or has occurred to you since conception. Since conception. So that means even when you were in your mother's womb, if you had a feeling or your mother didn't want you or tried to abort you or whatever, that feeling of not being wanted will still be in you. It will still be there. You will not get rid of it because it is stored in your amygdala and your amygdala cannot cleanse itself. The only way you can get your amygdala cleansed is through the Holy Spirit. The only way. And just like stored toxins in our body, we get sicker and sicker and sicker. Do you know something? And this is why so many people have emotional problems in their, mo in, in their lives. They just do not know how to handle their emotional problems because they've got to back up or backlog in their brain. They have never cleansed any of these unwanted emotions. And they're stored up in there. And that's why it's just coming to a stage where all of a sudden they just don't know where to turn. They just don't know how to handle. So any of these stored up memories and feelings of trauma and abuse and hurts, pain, abandonment, Family dysfunction, negative emotions will eventually break down our emotional health. And if you are not spiritually healed from these damaging emotions, when something happens to trigger a trauma, you will respond in the same way that you did when the trauma was initially occurred. For instance, if you had a trauma as a young child when you were one or five or whatever, ten, guess what? When that tr pressure, trigger of pressure is placed on you, do you know what? You will revert back to the age when that trauma originally happened. That's why you have so many adults who have childish behaviours because they have never been healed of that initial trauma or those initial... Um, feelings. I want you to think back to Peter, the disciple Peter, when the little servant girl pointed the finger of scorn at him at Christ's trial. Desire of Ages says, 673, when Peter said he would follow his Lord to prison and death, he meant it, every word of it, but he did not know what was his hidden in his heart. Hidden in his hearts were elements of evil, notice the word, elements of evil that circumstances would fan to life. Unless he were made conscious of his danger, these would prove his eternal ruin. The Saviour saw in him a self-love and assurance that would overbear his love for Christ. Much of infirmity, unmortified sin, 
carelessness of spirit, unsanctified temper and heedlessness of entering into temptation had been revealed in his experience. Christ's solemn warning was to heart searching. Peter needed to distrust himself and have a deeper faith in God. Now that quotation is powerful because it tells us that Peter, why he had that little servant girl pointed the finger of scorn at him, he immediately denied Christ because she says he had elements and evil and there are seven of them. I've actually gone through the whole seven of those elements of evil and I've analysed them all and you know what? I believe almost all of us have them. And remember she says that Peter, Christ's solemn warning was to heart searching. You see, we are going through the end of time. We are going through the time when Jesus cannot afford to close probation and then have one of his 144,000 sin. Cannot happen. We have to be rid of these elements of evil that are hidden in our hearts. How do we get rid of them? Well, I believe we get rid of them through, he reveals it through the sanctuary. This is where we get rid of it. And you see up on the overhead a picture of the sanctuary. There are seven steps in the sanctuary. I believe this is the way, a pathway that God will heal us. It will be a pathway to the throne. It will be a pathway to eternal life, to salvation, whatever you want. This is God's way. God's way is in the sanctuary. He heals us. He heals us physically by the way of the sanctuary. He will heal us emotionally and mentally by the way of the sanctuary. Let's just for a moment think of the seven steps. I'll just touch on each one. First of all is the gate. The gate is where we choose to come to God. The gate is our choice. We know we can't do it of ourselves. This is it, God. You've got to do it for me. But we enter the gate with thanksgiving and praise. We get our eyes and focus off ourselves. We have to fix them onto Jesus. This is the way God says it. This is the way we have to do it. Praise. Praise him for everything you do and you can think of. So constantly praising him. Next we've got the altar of sacrifice. This is where we have to humble ourselves and we actually have to confess any sins we have committed. We have to lay all our life. But we also have to ask God to dig back into our memories and ask him to reveal to us these unwanted emotions and hurts that have happened in our life. And I believe not many people are realising that that's what we need to do. And these are what are defeating us in our Christian experience. When we confess and we ask his to cover us from all sin, and this is the, at the altar we lay all our cares for that day at the feet of Jesus. We ask him to, to um, take it all. Then we go to the laver. This is where God washes and he cleanses us. And this is where we ask him, say, Lord, you have to look into my mind. You have to look into my, you know what's on my heart. You know what's in my amygdala. You know what's there. Please bring it to the front because I don't want these thoughts anymore. I want them washed. And how do we wash them? We wash them by the word of God. We have to renew that those tapes that are running through our mind, we have to renew them and we have to, like we have to tape over them, like the old-fashioned tape recorders. We have to go over the top of them. It's not enough just to erase them. We have to go over the top of them and put new thoughts in. Those new thoughts have to be thoughts of his truth, the truth, his promises, his precious promises. The candlestick is where we receive the light, the power, the love. We've received the fruits of his spirit. We receive the gifts of the spirit. As I said, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We receive his power, light and his power. 
The table of showbread is the next step. This is where we feed on his character. We feed on him. We think on how he reacted all the time. We feed on his worth. And we eat his word to strengthen our body. And we learn of his character. This is what we go through. Then we have the altar of incense. And this is the place of communication between God and his people. And here we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain his grace and mercy. And this is where we have intercessory prayer on behalf of our loved ones. We intercede. And I like to think of it here as like we have God's telephone number. And guess what? When he rings up, we say, God, I need such and such. And he says, here I am. Remember Isaiah 58 says, he says, I will call and I will answer you and I'll come to you. I will answer your prayer. He will say, here am I and I will, and I will do what you want me to do because there's nothing between us and God. We're confessing everything. I'd like to rely, and I just think of those years ago when I was a young girl, we used to sing a song called Royal Telephone. Remember that? Central's never busy, always on the line. So we have God's royal telephone number so we can speak to him. Then we go to the next step is the Ark of the Covenant. And this is where we are living holy lives. We are walking with God. We are in agreement with God. We are cleansed of our motives and impulses. Now, it's really interesting because Ellen White talks about us that we are going to be judged not only on our actions, we are also going to be judged on our thoughts and our motives. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't even know what all my motives really are. You know, I, don't, I can't fathom them. It's just some of them are hidden. So I have to ask him, I said, Lord, please reveal it. Reveal it to me. And remember these first three steps that I just went through, the gate, the altar, and the laver, they are the steps of cleansing. You will never get into the holy place and most holy place if you are not cleansed. Remember the priest had to cleanse himself before he was allowed into the holy place and most holy place. So we have to be cleansed. We have to be cleansed of all these toxic thoughts, toxic things. We have to be cleansed. Now, what about our amygdala? Remember I said it is where all our emotions have been stored. And I like to think of it as like Hebrews 12 verses 14 and 15 where, God, where Paul says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man can see the Lord. And then they go on to, it goes on to say, it says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, therefore many may be defiled. Very interesting, isn't it? What are roots of bitterness? Now, if you could say, what's a root of bitterness? Most of you, and you probably could think of a few. But I believe all of these, and we're going to talk about more of them in a moment, but I believe that they are a result of emotional damage that has happened to us all throughout our life. By the hurts, that we have suffered, and by the way, I know all of us have also hurt others. We're not always the ones that have received these hurts. We are also ones who have given these hurts to others too. We need to confess that as well. And God is wanting us to be healed of these. And remember, he's going to heal it if we do it his way. Remember Peter when he was at the foot washing ceremony with Jesus and Peter 
actually said, no, no, Lord, you can't wash my feet. And he says, no, I need to wash your feet, Peter. You need to be cleansed. And then Jesus said, I now pronounce you clean, all of you except one, who we know was Judas. I said, okay, now Peter, at this stage, in, as far as Jesus was concerned, was pronounced cleansed. But we know it wasn't long, only a matter of hours later, or a day or so later, when he denied Christ. Now, how do we come to terms with this? Well, I believe the clue is given to us in Desire of Ages, chapter Servant of Servants, where Ellen White talks about Peter and how he needed, how God had accepted all the disciples and they were all accepted. They all were his. He accepted them as his and they were classed as, in, in, in our terms we would say, well, they, had, they were going to be saved. But then there's two words that she used, but Peter needed a higher cleansing. Now what's that higher cleansing? I believe that higher cleansing are those roots of bitterness that Peter showed. Remember those seven points that I said? Unmortified sin, carelessness of spirit, unsanctified temper, all those things. That's, those are the, that is the higher cleansing that Peter was told to, to have. Check out those words. There's twice in that chapter she uses the word higher cleansing. And what has happened to us, we need to do the same because what's happened, almost every single one, we have all been damaged, some to a greater, some to a lesser degree. But God will heal it if we come to him and we do it his way. We have to, but we have to confess and repent of them. And as I said, so many of us have a backlog. We haven't done it, probably. Some of us, I'm sure, have never done it. Never, ever been cleansed of these, unwo uh, 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 these emotions. I believe this particular cleansing has to be done, as I said, in the courtyard. It's a courtyard experience. You cannot get into the holy place or most holy place if you do not have this cleansing. And I believe this is where I know for myself and a lot of people that I know, this is what's trick tripping us up all the time in our Christian experience. Because you know something? We want to have this experience. We want to be right with God. But somehow or other we just lose it on such little things. I mean, I have a husband who is really quite an easy man to live with. He's a good Christian man. But, you know, sometimes just something tiny, he would just say, oh, where did you put the torch? I said, I don't know. You know, I'll answer like that. You know, in a way that really... That's not in control of my spirit. I'm like defensive. I'll answer with a defensive attitude. Or I'll get annoyed with somebody. Uh, usually for me, it's not those tiny, it's not those huge things now with me. It's these little things. Oh, I'll just roll my eyes and I'll think, oh no, not again. That sort of thing. You know, Christ never did any of that. We can't afford to have any of that. And, you know, Christ promises to get rid of that if we bring that to him. We can have complete victory. Do you know how often we have talked about it in the past? You know, the God's people will be victorious. They will have be overcomers. But how few overcomers do we know? First of all, I believe if we want, and God will be using us, we'll use us and he will get us to help other people, but first of all, we have to experience it ourselves. You cannot help others if you have not had it experienced. 
So how do we know what are the roots of bitterness? Well, firstly, we have to ask God to reveal it to us. And sometimes, remember, it can go back to the third and the fourth generation. It can be passed on to us through our parents. Sometimes it's not obvious. It can be passed on through the, up to the third and fourth generation. And Jesus knows this. He wants us to heal. Remember, we are in the time of judgment now. God knows what's on our books. We are in the time of judgment now. So at this stage, we have to go through and help, help identify our feelings, feelings. Now, what I've done here, I've got a sheet here that if maybe if some people, they've got some sheets up there to hand out. I wanted to share, I wanted to share with you today something to take home so you can remember what I've talked about today. I want to go through just briefly this and I made it on put it on green paper so that you can fold it up and you don't lose it. It's not as easy to lose. You can fold it up and put in your Bible. And on this page I have uh, first of all the sanctuary prayer outline then I have a roots of bitterness and then over the page I have a cleansing prayer outline and I'll talk about that in a moment but for anybody who is watching this on DVD who would be interested because I've got quite a lot of information it's quite small font so that I could pack it in a little page for you um, and there are over 100 roots of bitterness that I've, I've got here. And so if anybody who is watching on DVD wants to, um, wants to get a copy of this, just email me at backtoeden at aapt.net.au. And I'll get that out to you. And also there's texts, there's many Bible texts. I have not given the Bible texts to you here because they are just far too many, but there are countless Bible texts that you can correspond. And in your own private study, you can go, uh, uh, go on these. Okay, on the first page, the sanctuary prayer outline. And this is, I'm not going to read this extensively for you. Back to Eden at aapt.net.au. And so what I've got on the first page here is the sanctuary prayer outline. First of all is the gate, and I've just touched on that before. Then is the altar of sacrifice. Then is the laver, then the candlestick, the showbread, the altar of incense, and the second apartment. So what I've got here are the steps that you can walk through in your prayer as you're going through this and you're working through these roots of bitterness. Now this is really... The list is what really the whole talk is about, these roots of bitterness. Now, some years ago I did a study and I found probably 50 or 60 roots of bitterness in the Ellen White disc. But I've compiled some more and I've added some more since then and there are over 100 roots of bitterness that I've got here. Now, I'm not going to read them all out to you right now but I'll just read a few because some people might be watching this on DVD and they might be interested to in know what I've been talking about. I'll just pick a few here and there. A need to be always right. Anger. Anxiety. Blaming others. Comparing yourself to others. Constantly late. Critical. Defensive. Disrespect. Evil speakings, evil surmisings, fault finding, fear, feelings of stupidity, gluttony. And I actually could have put on there overeating. You see, don't you think that 
We call it overeating, but the scriptures call it gluttony, don't they? Gossiping, impatience, insecurity, judgmental, love our own way, opinionated, pride, self-defense, self-reliance, selfishness, stubborn, talking of others' faults, unbelief, vanity. Now that's just a few here and there. I've just picked them out. And I believe when we start going through these, now these are definitely not the only sins and the only roots of bitterness. There are more. If you can find more, please add to them. But this is just to help you get started. And I'm sure that you'll look at them and you'll say to yourself, well, most all of them are me. And it's true, we have probably in ourselves, but you know, there are some we've gained victory over. But there's some that are, have roots of bitterness or they are rooted right deep down in our amygdala. Remember, the only way they can be cleansed is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I also thought of another one there that could have gone on that list after that is procrastination. Don't keep putting this off. This has to be done. I believe we're in a time in history that we can't put this off. Over the page, then there is the cleansing prayer. Now, how you do this, or you, you, you do this in the courtyard experience. The sanctuary prayer goes right through, but the cleansing prayer is the courtyard experience because we have to be clean. Now, I'll just read through the parts that have been underlined is you can go through it all and I'm not reading it all out to you because it'll take too much time but it says begin your prayer by praising God offering thanksgiving to him by naming specific blessings you have received especially during the past 24 hours ask God to reveal anything that has separated you from him this may include wrong behavior negative thoughts sinful feelings wrong desires criticism, resentment and bitterness or painful memories. And you know, I believe so many of us have committed these things and they've become so, we have become so used to doing them, we don't even see them as sin. We don't even see them as sin. Some of our frailties. Once he has revealed your sin or painful emotions, confess these by claiming his blood to cover the sin and heal your painful emotions. Ask Jesus to cleanse your memories or of the sin or painful emotions. Ask Jesus to cleanse you to the third and fourth generation where the tendency to this sin may have been passed on through your lineage. Ask Jesus to cleanse you from sin and remove the painful emotions from your amygdala. Ask Jesus to cleanse your books in heaven where the sin is recorded and the memory of it. Ask Jesus to cover you with his robe of righteousness, his perfect life. Ask Jesus to blot the, out the sin and put it on the head of the scapegoat. Conclude by asking Jesus to cast out all demons associated with the sin, sending them in, into the abyss and binding there for the day of judgment, never to return. Then ask Jesus to recreate you according to the original plan that he ordained for you to follow when his mind conceived you and heal the damage that sin has made in your mind and emotions. Ask Jesus to seal you into his truth and write his law upon your heart, complaining, claiming specific promises that address your sin or painful emotions. Ask Jesus to give you this fullness of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. Ask Jesus to remind you of his promises when tempted. I just think it's a beautiful way. And look, I have been doing this for some years now, but I have really increased it because I just feel... It's like I have believe it's so imperative that we start doing this now and God starts cleaning us more and more and more and more. Because we're in the time of the investigative judgment. We have got books in heaven written 
there are written and on our pages are written any unconfessed sins. Now Jesus is in heaven. He is our friend. He is our advocate. He is our brother. And he comes to me and he says, Kay, guess what? There is still some unconfessed sin in heaven. You have still got pride in your heart. Kay, you still compare yourself to others. Kay, you still overeat at times. Kay, and goes on. Look at all these things. You are self-reliant. You talk too much. You interrupt people. You interrupt conversations. And Lord is saying to me, come on, these roots of bitterness have to go before God seals his people. Because if they're there, we won't be sealed. Remember, the latter rain falls on a clean and people. Remember that. Then it is not enough just to erase these messages. We have to tape over them. Then remember, we got the text this morning. And I thought that was incredible that Gabriel touched on the same text that I was talking about here, that I'm talking about here. We ha- in Proverbs 28, 13, where we have to confess our sins, but there's another part to it as well. We have to forsake them. It is no good just confessing them and having them still there and then just going back into them. We have to forsake them. We have to put them behind us. We have to choose not to do them anymore. So then I will have to think what I, watch what I eat, watch what I say, watch what I wear, watch what I do, watch what I talk, watch what I, everything I have to watch. I have to be very, very careful. Because we have to be able to be like this. We have to do this to become people of God. Remember the latter rain never, I should say Pentecost, never fell on the unclean disciples. What did they do before that? They spent time and this is going to take time. This is going to take time and we're going to have to wrestle with God. You remember we told that the people of God, God's people will be wrestling with God like Jacob? That's going to be us. We have to do it. We have to have that. We have to have that Pentecost experience. Remember, it took 10 days of heart searching for those disciples to be ready to receive the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Do you think it's going to be any different now? It's going to be the same. And what we're doing, we have to understand, we have to ask God to change us completely. Do you know, if he could change Paul, if he could change Peter, if he could change John, he could change us. Do you know, when I first heard of all these emotional damaged and that because we've everybody has been damaged but some more or some less i did not understand and have any idea of the magnitude that's happening now in this world because so many people have been damaged so many people need to hear his voice need to be healed of them of this um these unwanted emotions. I want to just close with these few words here. It says, Ye shall receive power, 295. The latter rain is to fall upon the people of God. A mighty angel is to come down from heaven and the whole earth is to be lighted with his glory. Are we ready to take part in the glorious work of the third angel? Are our vessels ready to receive the heavenly dew? Do we have the defilement of sin in the heart? If so, let us cleanse the soul temple and prepare for the, shower, for the latter rain, showers of the latter rain. The refreshing from the presence of God will never come to hearts filled with impurity. 
May God help us to die to self that the hope, Christ, the hope of glory may be formed within. Now these are powerful words, aren't they? Once we have this healing inside of us, then we are able to go out and to help others. And I believe God is able to do it. I believe that he is going to be able to do it abundantly. But soon, very soon, I believe it will be a cut-off time. It's very interesting that Gabriel said, today is the day of salvation. It's the same with us today here. Today, we cannot afford to procrastinate. We cannot to put anything off. He will be able to help us if we choose to do it his way. And his way is in the sanctuary. And we know that if we walk through the sanctuary, we will, re we will get to where God wants us to be. He wants us to be with him in the most holy place now. But we cannot be with him in the most holy place if we have a defilement of sin in our heart. So we have to get rid of it. And we have to do it on our knees, forsaking, confessing, repenting and all the things that I have been talking to you about. Then we are able to go out and share this with others and this is what true medical missionary work is about. So this is my prayer that we all have this vision that we are, want to be cleansed and we want to be healed. Okay, let's just finish and we'll bow, with, bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just th so thankful that you've given us ways where we can come to you, ways of escape, ways to escape the captivity and the snares of Satan. And we know Satan has been so busy, so busy everywhere. He's been busy working in all our hearts, Lord. He's been busy working in the hearts of everyone. So we just pray now that you'd give us the desire to want to dig down, to dig up these roots of bitterness, to be healed of them, to be cleansed of them. Because, Lord, we want to be part of the people that receives the latter rain. So, Lord, we just pray that you would do this. Give us clean hearts, we pray. And bless us now abundantly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.